and discovery of symbol um, uh, to together the community of New Orleans in the Superdome was able to make metaphor or make make meaning make uh, was able to sanctify the saints in a way their their um, parade of victories um, symbolized some some uh, sense of hope for the community um, so I, what I thought I'd do is go for maybe uh, 20 minutes being as I am uh, mediocre meat between two slices of excellent bread um, uh, I, I, I will not outlive my function I will not so I'll go for 20 minutes and, and say as much as I can within that space of time. Uh, let's see. Um, so I, uh, I thought I'd try defining a few, defining a few terms and uh, uh, shifting again that way. Um, uh, yeah. uh, the purpose of theater, the root of the word theater, its, its injunction is to see and to see socially. By knowing something as a people, we know each other and ourselves personally and incarnate. We interpret ourselves and others in light of the person, shared to the point of impersonality. I would say theater for peace is no more natural than peace for theater. We do not have one for the sake of the other. I'll also say that we can't really have one without the other. Putting theater in process in order to cause peace, or putting peace in process in order to cause theater, or cooking in order to cause silverware, or driving in order to cause radios, may function, but the way is inexact. In the case of art and peace, inefficiency cause uh, mistrust and burnout. So as theater artists, we may feel personally morally obligated to perform acts of peace, and in doing so, this, this operation of guilt may lure us off our basis as theater artists. If we're going to make Peace, it will not be as peacemakers, it will be as theater makers. So how do we direct the practice of theater in a way that will result in peace without pretending that theater was built to cause peace? Theater is built to cause theater, I believe. Uh, so the care that's taken with, for example, staging and memorization and the stakes of performance is a crucial element, I think, of theater of witness, at, at least from, from where I sat. Uh, both theater and peace building are embodied practices. Peace building is a bodily practice. Freedom from harm is a chief right, for example, and peace is the body, I would say, is in the body. Uh, and both of them look to understand this absolute position of our accident of meat. They are not each other's child or parent. They are siblings. They are different and related. So theater for social change, theater for development, and art in the communities these impulses are often used to justify uh, theater from without, overtaking art as defined by the art makers, imposing extra dramatic responsibilities. Once the art has been categorized and symbolized, it is stripped of its aesthetic basis and held to results not of its own making. While truly theater must firm its footing in community, its work there and its monstrance of community's heart must remain self-described and original. Theater must be held to theatrical tasks rather than defined in terms of what it's doing outside of itself. Uh, it, was, it was very popular in the 90s, for example, in the States to talk about the economic value of theater, but it will never be as, as profitable as crack cocaine, for example. So does that make crack a little bit better than theater? Um, art, is, uh, art is for social change operating as art. New means of community formation, a new sense of the body, the border, new energies around the composition of families and the civic, reaffirm experiments with story, with history, with reading and memory. To the extent that theater practice is designed to be liminal, where its outcome is intended expressly to promote peace, it should be balanced by a category of peace building whose success is measured in the number of plays it produces. Cultural expression as a distinct measurable outcome of peace building. If peace builders or politicians who, who are uh, mouthing words of peace want to hold theater to the task of, uh, you know, accountable to X amount of peace per play produced, I think we have to be fair and say that a peace process is proper if plays are resulting. Um, experiment is impartial, responsible improvisation towards an uncertain outcome. So you're experimenting if you don't know what's going to happen. 
An example of revolution without an experiment is, for example, a military coup, where uh, you'll try this, but you really know what's going to happen in the end, or you, expect, you have an expected outcome. If art and peace building are to be revolutionary, if they are to affect change, to subvert stasis and idolatry, then art and peace building must be experimental. They must do everything they can in an improvisational way without knowing what's going to happen. Otherwise, they're not experimenting. The marketplace and civil doctrine restrain us exactly here when they feel threatened. And in the genius that authority has for a conservation of wealth, it sets art and peace at each other. We are being used to control each other's behavior, and the experimental nature of our experiments are often denatured. We're being robbed of the subversion our practices require. In accepting each other as each other's outcome, we are made insecure in our processes, and our insecurity leads us to equip ourselves with the spare parts of each other's machinery, performing formal tasks whose impact is obscure, but whose operation is certain. There is a huge loss of vitality. So we don't know what we're doing or how to do it. Uh, by uh, muddying, uh, by muddying our aims. Uh, I would say that still excellence persists. There is insistence on principles of organization that exceed corporate and nationalistic models. The world is organizing its prime energies along new channels. Storytelling styles that insist on private control of wealth of history are passing away. And where they survive are in service of processes of symbolization that are in a panic drive to hold on to the equipment of segregation. Genocide, for example, needs linear narrative, it needs you to believe that this leads to this and there is a conclusive outcome. In address, experiment needs to refresh its quietude, its certainty, its me uh, and members of the family of the incarnated ideal must know their souls and use them. So to uh, Ignatian spirituality, for example, we have to ask what we are for, according to what, by what means we are able to reach our natural aims, and what will change on the basis of our getting there. Just as a song is made by singing, and an act of justice invokes justice absolutely, so a person is made through people by expressing humanity. If, if my song will be sung, it will be sung by singing it. If I am a person alive, it will be through you, it will be through us as a people that I am alive. We are made as humans to be with humans, to be more than ourselves individually. So a, a few words I wanted to get at. Peace, theater, community, and institution. So for, for peace, uh, the chant that we've all heard is no justice, no peace. And art for social change, social justice for peace, uh, these terms tend to slide. The overlay is in a Solomonic framing where justice isn't judgment, but the creation of circumstances where nature can reveal itself. So in the story of Solomon, who's quite a smart man by all accounts, um, uh, uh, in that story, Solomon doesn't say, you are the mother. Solomon presents stages a situation in which the mothers can reveal their natures. And that's what wisdom is, and that's what justice is. The, that arena that doesn't make decisive claims, but that arena that allows nature, in which nature can reveal itself, the truth of things can reveal itself. This is why, again, I think this theater of witness is so important in, in representing various sides of an equation. It's not, um, it's not foregrounding a conclusion. It's actually, through fact, problematizing facts. Uh, Gachacha, I don't know if you're going to talk about Gachacha later, but Gachacha is, is that um, uh, uh, device in, in Rwanda based on, on um, uh, uh, long, long-standing Rwandan customs where, whereby um, uh, genocide was tried. There were too many perpetrators for the courts to handle. Immediately after the genocide in Rwanda, a country I've, I've visited a few times, um, there were 12 uh, jurists in the country, 12 lawyers in the country, and there were over a million perpetrators, you know, or, um, you know one may imagine over a million perpetrators. Um, there, there would be no way of, of getting through the course load by this. So against uh, the will of the international community, which only gets together to cover their own asses, if I may say, 
um, they, they, they went ahead with the gachacha, which is an, inf an informal court system. Again, informal court system, by, depending upon what standard you, you want to hold. Where an entire community would get together once or twice a week over the course of several years to hear all the stories in the town. And the gachacha would be able to pass sentence, but the sentences were always absurdly low and rather uniform. So you could be guilty of killing somebody in a genocidal fashion and get about 12 years of prison with six years served for time and then part of the rest of your sentence served, you know, community service. The sentences were not what it's about. What it was about is that the community heard itself. So at a gachacha, you'd be sitting on a bench under a tent and on a hot day and uh, a girl of 10 would be able to stand up and turn to the man next to her and say, why was your wife wearing my mother's bloody dress the day after she was killed. Why did that happen? Why, why did she have that dress on? And then it would come out that, of course, he was the man who killed her mother. And they would have, then they would be able to say, and now it's your turn to go to jail. Now it's your turn to go to jail. There is no redress. The, the image of, of scales for justice is all wrong unless justice is blind. Justice can only be blind if if they think things may be balanced in redress. For a crime such as that, not only to kill the mother, but to par parade her dress on the body of your wife through town the next day, there is no redress for that. Um, the justice can only be in the community able to re-inhabit its own story, to symbolize itself again, to know itself again, to speak itself again. Um, uh, yeah. um, Yes, so I just go on to say that that's, that's quite a thing. Um, uh, uh, what, a, what, a, um, what the gachacha does is it forces someone to put it into words. You couldn't just say, it's quite relentless actually, or in cases where I've seen it, it's quite relentless. The, what, what a number of perpetrators I've talked to have wanted to say was, it was, it was the devil, the devil overtook me. And I, I would agree with that, the devil overtook them. But, where was the key to your door that the devil overtook you? Um, what, how did you admit the devil into your presence? What was that like? And you, the person must be induced to give it words. I, I killed them in a state of heightened pleasure. I killed them in a state of great fear or greed. They have to find the word. And this is elementally theatrical, finding the word for the deed. In the Latin for for word goes to uh, uh, para parabola and parable. The idea of a parable and a parabola are the same. And the idea of a word, what its root in our understanding, or at least in, in the Latin tradition, is, is to throw something, like in an art, to throw something next to something. To give word to something is not to name it in a way that sits something on top of it, crushing it. It's to get something pretty close to it. And this, I think, is that aesthetic uh, process of experiment or quality of experiment that's so important to work like this. It's not to say, this is it, or to come up with the solution. It's to get something as close as possible as we can in a way that allows us all to wonder about how much closer it may, it may have gotten. So imprecision and, um, uh, or precise imprecision and uh, uh, public co-ownership is, is crucial to this work. There's more some other time about the prison system there. Uh, good. Um, uh, here Thomas, I just go on and on here. I'm, I'm going to. I've got seven more minutes, so I want to be precise here. Um, uh, I'll say that you you are what you let save you. You are what you let save you. Um, and in Thinking about theater and peace building, we we tend to leap to institutions, and in our in our fear, in our clutching after institutional thinking, is that what we want to have save us? Um, an institution itself is not safety; it's actually anxiety over safety. An institution is the body bodying forth of anxiety. Will you put your faith in anxiety and magnify your your anxiety? Or will you trade security for a prohibition against improvisation? Theater and peace, even theatrical and peaceful institutions, 
are best when they're anti-institutional. An institution holds resources apart. How do our institutions promote transparency to the point of invisibility? And how are they the property of the audiences we serve? So justice is the defense of nature's ability to define itself. Human nature is plural. Effect diversity, where we are, in, we are distinct but in bond, as the portico of the architecture of art and peace. In true diversity, the good isn't purged from evil. The perfection of hygiene is a fascist tool. Diversity is the marriage of heaven and hell. They may live together. This is what Cindy was going after, I think, when she was talking about how forgiveness isn't always necessary for reconciliation. Reconciliation being architectural that way. They, uh, uh, the good and the bad may, may live side by side. Again, a, a situation very prevalent in Rwanda. 